Similar to the failure of the Sterling brand under the Rover Group, the Mercure mark of Ford Europe was another attempt to introduce cars of a European size and performance onto the American market in order to rival the likes of BMW, Audi, Honda and Mercedes-Benz. But what resulted instead was a series of barely noticed variants of Ford's European models that struggled to find a place among a sea of opponents. The story of Mercure begins in the mid-1980s, where, coming off the protracted Malays era, the retreating Detroit Big Three of Ford, General Motors and the Chrysler Group had left the American market wide open for exploitation by a new breed of smaller and more efficient models built by European and Japanese car makers, with early inroads by BMW, Mercedes-Benz, Toyota and Honda taking a large chunk of sales away from the established domestic manufacturers across all segments, ranging from high-end Cadillacs and Lincolns to mid-level Buicks and Oldsmobiles, and down to Ford and Chevy family cars. The biggest change during this period was the rise of what was known as the Sports Saloon, wherein, unlike the previously popular traditional sports cars and personal luxury land yachts of the 1970s, a new wave of models appeared, which combined these two elements together in order to provide a machine with the interior trimmings and comforts of an executive car, but with improved acceleration and performance, the goal being to appeal to an emerging younger demographic of business people who desired more in a luxury car than what older generations of the type had to offer. BMW being the undisputed winner of this rapid trend with their 3 Series and 5 Series sports saloons. Soon, other car makers from Europe and Japan were capitalizing on this surge for sporty but comfortable saloons, leaving America's big three unable to compete directly as their own cars were based on far larger and heavier underpinnings. The closest early attempts to combat their European and Japanese rivals during the first half of the 1980s being with the likes of the Buick Grand National of 1982. It was during September of that year, though, that CEO of Ford's European division, Robert Lutz, put on sale its long-awaited replacement for the aging Cortina, the Ford Sierra, a somewhat controversial car at the time due to its aerodynamic styling making a stark contrast against the tastes of the more conservative Cortina buyer, but regardless was a huge success and would be complemented by a number of variants throughout its 11-year production life, among the more notable being the high-performance XR4i. Sporting the Ford 2.8-litre Cologne V6 engine, in combination with Bosch K Jetronic mechanical fuel injection and rear-wheel drive, the XR4i, while by far the underdog when compared to arguably more sophisticated rivals such as the Audi Coupe, was a winner for Ford in Europe, as it put up a stiff fight against the competition, providing performance that matched its opponents, while its three-door body shell with slightly bizarre multi-pillared rear windows and prominent double rear spoiler was enough to guarantee a 130 mile an hour maximum speed. With the Sierra having been the brainchild of Franco-German designers Patrick Le Camon and Uwe Barnson, Lutz saw that, in combination with its futuristic looks, the car touted handling, rear-wheel drive and four-wheel independent suspension that was the epitome of the highly popular sports saloon, and therefore he approached CEO of the Ford Group in America, Donald Peterson, as to the possibility of selling the Sierra XR4i in the United States in order to do battle with the BMW 3 Series. This wasn't the first time Ford had done this, the most prominent example of the past being with the Mercury Capri between 1970 and 1978, an Americanized version of the legendary Ford Capri of Europe that was built in Germany before being shipped to the USA and sold under the Lincoln Mercury division as a captive import, the Capri being a modest success in the United States but was eventually killed off due to unstable fuel prices and a weak exchange rate, being replaced by a domestically built new model which continued the Capri name. While Peterson was enthused by the concept, numerous hurdles had to be overcome before the car would enter sales on the American market, the most immediate being a change of the car's name from Sierra due to the presence of the GMC Sierra pickup truck, and therefore, to avoid any potential copyright infringement, and to be in keeping with the alphanumeric names of its rivals, the American version of the car would be christened simply the XR4i. Next was the issue of meeting US emission standards, as while it was initially thought that the 150 horsepower Cologne V6 would be suitable, and had been proven to work wonders on the European XR4i, the power plant had origins that stretched back nearly 20 years to the Ford Taunus 20M of 1964, and therefore, in light of meeting US regulatory requirements, modifications to this power plant to make it appropriate for American roads would strangle its power and make it non-competitive. In response, Ford opted to introduce the 2.3-litre overhead cam Lima Turbo inline-four engine from the ninth-generation Ford Thunderbird personal luxury coupe, and while this proved to be heavier than the Cologne V6, it compensated by increasing the power to 175 horsepower, allowing the XR4i to match the Sierra's 130 mile an hour top speed, although the higher weight of the engine didn't suit the XR4i's European build, vibrating strongly at high RPMs. 
while the inclusion of a turbocharger saw the car renamed to the XR4Ti. While the practical problems of the car's running had been largely overcome, next followed the issue of selling the XR4Ti, with Lutz's initial proposal to create a dedicated dealer network in the United States for the car being axed by Peterson on the grounds of expense, his desire being to have the car sold through Lincoln Mercury dealers at 800 selected locations, while in Europe, as the massive success of the domestic Sierra meant there was little to no production floor space available at their Cologne factory to build the American variant, Ford was forced to contract out building of the car to German automobile manufacturer Carmen at their factory in Osnabrück, panelling for the car being supplied by Ford's Genk factory in Belgium, before the cars were hand-built to completion by Carmen. Finally came the name of the brand under which the XR4Ti would be sold, this decision coming down to Peterson, who chose to christen the mark Mercur, the German word for Mercury, with theories suggesting that, based on the success of the Mercure brand on the American market for providing sports saloons, the future direction of the firm would be to axe the traditional Mercury brand of executive and high-end family cars and replace it with the new Mercure mark going forward as a dedicated division to battle BMW and Audi. Entering sales in September 1984, initial road tests of the XR4Ti were largely positive, the 7 second 0 to 60 time and 130 mile an hour top speed of the car leading many reviewers to believe the press cars provided had been doctored in order to give a false impression of the eventual production model, while the 24 mile per gallon fuel consumption of the Mercure was on par with the Audi Coupe's 24 miles per gallon and slightly lower than the BMW 320i's 27 miles per gallon. However, glowing reviews of the car on a practical level did little to spur on sales, as all manner of factors conspired against the Mercure to bring about the Mark's failure. The choice of the name Mercure, which was difficult to pronounce and particularly non-intuitive, being blamed as the main choice as to why American buyers were unenthusiastic about purchasing the XR4Ti. At the same time, due to the complicated production process for the car, the price of the XR4Ti was pushed up to $16,503, or $43,362 in 2021, while the BMW 320i cost $13,200, and the Audi Coupe cost $14,775, compounded further by the sale of the car through Lincoln and Mercury dealerships, the sales staff, who were more accustomed to selling luxury cars and high-end family models, being inexperienced in the sale of sports saloons and therefore struggled to pitch the machine to potential buyers. Against a projected sales output of 16,000 to 20,000 units per year, only 12,000 were sold during the first year due to a lack of brand recognition and the model's inability to find a unique selling point against BMW and Audi the car's troubles being made worse through the introduction in 1985 of the Acura brand by Honda as another alternative to domestic American models. While a deteriorating exchange rate between the US dollar and the Deutschmark meant the car's MSRP had to climb against its production costs. Undaunted, Ford believed there was still hope for the Mercure brand, and in 1987 introduced the Mark's second model in the form of the Mercure Scorpio, an almost direct translation of the Ford Granada Scorpio Mark I later to be known simply as the Ford Scorpio from 1989 onward, an executive saloon that would become the Mark's flagship model and intended to do battle against both European models, such as the Audi 100, BMW 5 Series, Mercedes-Benz 190e, Saab 9000, Sterling 827 and Volvo 740 and 760, but also Japanese models like the Acura Legend and the upcoming Lexus LS. Essentially, the Mercure Scorpio was the same five-door hatchback on offer in Europe, and was chosen to fit beneath the Mercury Sable in the executive car market by being generally smaller in terms of dimensions, while also carrying over a variety of innovations not yet available on the US motoring scene, including four-wheel independent suspension, standard anti-lock brakes or ABS, and four-wheel disc brakes. Although unlike the XR4Ti, the Scorpio was able to retain its original Cologne 2.9-litre V6 engine, producing 144 horsepower, and paired with either a five-speed manual transmission or a four-speed overdrive automatic as an option. Again though, the lack of recognition for the Mercure Mark, combined with its base price of $23,390 or $56,210 in 2021, meant it was still a pricey option when compared to domestic and Japanese products, the equivalent Mercury Sable costing $12,766, the Buick LeSabre costing $13,913, and the Acura Legend costing $20,793, although it did prove to be moderately cheaper than European rivals the BMW 5 Series costing $33,925, the Mercedes-Benz W124 costing $22,000, and the Sterling 825 costing $23,000. Sadly, despite attempts to attract customers through the provision of a guaranteed resale value program through Lincoln Mercury dealers, 
matching the resale value of the Scorpio to the Mercedes-Benz 190E, the Mercure brand was ended in 1989 as sales continued to trickle against the competition, exacerbated by upcoming changes to American emissions legislation for 1990 that would require significant mechanical revisions to the Scorpio, a cost that was considered unjustified by the Ford management. The Scorpio and XL40i disappearing from sales after only 22,000 of the former and 59,000 of the latter had been purchased over the course of the Mark's five-year existence. In the end, the collapse of the Mercure Mark could be likened to a mixture of the factors that saw the failure of similar brands, the Sterling of Rover Group and Ford's own Edsel of the 1950s. One of the main reasons behind the Sterling's failure being due to a lack of brand recognition and a comparatively expensive price tag over domestic equivalents, while the Edsel also suffered in part due to a brand name that alienated customers. For Mercure, while the Ford Sierra could have indeed worked as a European sports rival to BMW and Audi, the car's prospects were all but dashed due to a rushed development of the Mercure brand, while the Scorpio, in light of its few advantages over domestic Mercury and Buick products, was a model doomed from the start in the United States. And with this, both models came and went without any real notice being given, another short-lived and long-lost brand that attempted to take on the US market.